Good morning and thank you very much for that kind introduction. I would have preferred that you keep your applause until afterwards because I'm worried that you may not applaud me when I'm done. <laughs> but I think the thing that brings us together this morning is what it is that is the incredible strength of our country. The sense of Ubuntu. The sense of understanding that what it is that is full of the possibilities of taking our country forward is an understanding that we've got to care about each other. That the solidarity that's been the cornerstone of how we responded to apartheid has to be a feature of how we go forward. And so in the trade union movement, we have a slogan that says an injury to one is an injury to all. And that is a slogan that really was embraced by all of our people, black and white, those who stood up and raised their voices against apartheid. Because there's no doubt that white people were the beneficiaries of apartheid. There were many who stood up and said the system is unjust exactly because it marginalizes and excludes so many of their brothers, black and white. And so what we must do is to remember those values that brought us to the point where we can understand that we've got to respond to things in a different way. We have to appreciate that our interests and our futures are interrelated and that what we must do in South Africa is to understand that the way in which we respond to the poor and the marginalized is, a, is an essential component of how we're able to proceed. And we must ensure that we address their problems, not out of a sense of charity, but because our common posterity will only be found if we embark on those journeys together. We knew that in 1994 that there would be incredible tasks ahead of us. But we also knew that if we worked together, we could achieve that and we could undo the legacy of apartheid and build a nation that represents the ambitions of all of our people and responds to the legitimate expectations of what represents a country where people care about each other and respond to each other's needs. And so we founded that vision and that journey on a message that had resonated in our country since 1955 when our brothers and sisters, black and white, came together in Clip Town and adopted the Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter spoke about what South Africa would look like, that there would be no divisions between black and white, that never again will people discriminate against one another, that what we must do is find a way to respond to the needs of all of our people. And we took those values that were enshrined in the Freedom Charter and we captured it in the Reconstruction and Development Program. And even though the Reconstruction and Development Program was the call to action by the ANC as part of the election manifesto in 1994, it essentially spoke to the majority of South Africans and what it is that we needed to do. Now, 1994 was a difficult time. We had not encountered each other. We had not had an experience other than from time to time battling against what it is we needed to do. And so, when we came together at that point, many of us were committed to doing the right things, but equally there were some amongst us who were scared about what it is that we needed to do. We now, 17 years later, we've had an opportunity to encounter each other, to experience each other, and that's reinforced some of our fears in some people, but it's also shown us that there are incredible opportunities if we come together and respond to things in a different way. And it's that that brings us together under the guise of the principle of Ubuntu. And so when we take any time to come together as South Africans, we must remind ourselves about what it is that we've been able to achieve in South Africa. Because often it's out of what you've been able to do that you're able to draw strength from the incredible tasks and challenges that lies ahead. And we have achieved much in this country. We've come back from the brink of a civil war before 1994. While we may not have always understood it in the suburbs where we continue to live our lives very comfortably, there was an assault on the system that had waged a brutality against our people that was going to interrupt and engulf all of us. And so the wisdom of our founding fathers found a way beyond those divides, started an engagement led by our number one citizen, today still Nelson Mandela, whose birthday will celebrate on Monday, but they took us on a journey that forged reconciliation as the only way forward. When we came together and we spoke about what it is that we needed to do after 1994, we all understood that we've got to respond to each other's ambitions and we've got to make sure that the legitimate ambition of both black and white, of rich and poor, is embraced in the conversations that take South Africa forward. That's what we signed on to when we said we want to build a new South Africa. That's what we committed to. And in fact, it is that commitment that took us back from the brink of civil war. 
At some stage, we must ask ourselves whether we've honored those commitments, whether we've undone the legacy of apartheid, whether we've shown the magnanimity that so many people who bore the brunt of apartheid have showed in embracing the prospects of a better tomorrow. And that must be the challenge that we call ourselves to question when we look at the questions of what does Ubuntu represent in our lives. And so all of the achievements that we've made, the fact that today women have a special role in our society that's affirmed and we've done the, undone the patriarchal legacy of apartheid, that we've built millions of houses across the length and breadth of South Africa in spite of the criticisms, the scandals and often the corruption that we've been able to bring our people together and put them on a path where the trajectory has prospects and possibilities for the future. So we have achieved so much. But even as we acknowledge how much we've achieved, we must appreciate that there's still so much that needs to be done. And so after 1994, when we embarked on the honeymoon period, we were all committed to making sure what we can bring about in this new South Africa, I think that was a good time in our country. We were at one. In spite of the stragglers, we didn't sign up to the project of the new South Africa yet. We had a common vision. We knew that we wanted to build a home for all of our people that accommodated everyone, that gave everyone the opportunities for the future. Then we came to 1996 with the first area of disagreement that emerged. And it wasn't disagreement between black and white. It was disagreements about where we take our country's economic policy and what it is that happens or what is the consequence there of our people. Now, there may be differences today still on what we have chosen in the world when we adopted the gear policies and whether we could have done anything better or whether we could have done anything different. That's something we've got to continue examining because it's only by analyzing the past and analyzing the consequences of some of the journeys that we've taken that we're able to ensure that we learn from those lessons and chart a wise path for the future. But whatever our views may be about the road that we took in 1996 when we adopted the new policies, what is not in question is the consequence in our country today. Unemployment has gone up from around 16% in 1994 to anywhere between 25 and 35% depending on who you talk to and which part of the country your figures are applied to. So that represents a huge challenge in respect to the jobs that needs to be created. Along with the levels of increase in unemployment, we've seen a deepening levels of poverty. In spite of the fact that we've been able to, be, we've been able to deliver basic services to so many of our people, the absolute levels and the relative levels of poverty in our society has increased. And that's something that undoes the prospects for social cohesion within a society, when people feel excluded and they don't feel invested in the system. And the surest way that that is reflected is by an irrefutable source. When they say that the Gini coefficient in South Africa is higher today than it was in 1994, the levels of inequality between rich and poor, between black and white, are worse today than what they were in 1994, that must be the clearest indication that we own the wrong path. And so that must call us all to take stock and evaluate where we are. Because there's no doubt that the economy had grown, had grown at astounding levels after decline at the end of apartheid. An average of three, three and a half percent of the last 15 years is an amazing growth rate. If it wasn't for the global economic crisis, which we are to some extent sheltered by by some of the measures that we put in place, we would have done really well in South Africa. But the difficulty and the challenge has been that the kind of growth that's come about in our country has largely been jobless growth. And that's why the inequalities have increased. So the wealthy, those who are in the system, have got more wealth, but the route we've chosen to go with the economy and the difficulties that befall poor people have, in, have continued. And so we see more and more that the social fabric in so many of our poor communities is disintegrating every day. You can't pick up a paper when you don't read of the devastation of drug abuse and how gangs and criminality hold many townships to hostage. And we're not going to create the environment where people are able to break out of the cycles of poverty unless we change that, unless we challenge that, both in the way that it manifests itself at a localized level, but also the systemic features that give rise to that. And so that's a challenge for all of us, because as I tried to say at the start, that our interests and our futures are interrelated. So we have to find common solutions. We have to find the route that gives rise to that. But in that environment of difficulties, where we're not responding to the systemic challenges, what have we seen? 
we've seen a deepening level of greed, where people have forgotten about the sense of Ubuntu, where black millionaires have given credibility to the white millionaires, where black greed has given credibility to white greed, corporate greed, political greed, all of the ways it's manifesting itself. We read in the papers all, every day about what the politicians have done. The stories are not covered as vigorously when we look at what the collusion around bread prices are. Now, bread price theft, the collusion, is probably worse than a politician stealing a million rand or two because you're stealing there from the poorest of the poor who battle to provide a loaf of bread for their families to feed them at a very basic level every day. That may be mentioned in a section of the Business Times, but it's not seen as a crime against our people. And that's the sense that we have to develop. We have to call each other out on the questions of corruption wherever it manifests itself, whether it's politicians, businessmen, anybody in any sector of life. And we've got to hold each other to our highest standard because it's that that we promised, each, we promised our people. Now, all of that features gives rise to what we see in our communities and our society today. The demonstrations that take place for water and basic services across the country is a reflection of people's deep unhappiness. I certainly don't think that there's an unwillingness on the side of people to tighten their belt as we start to undo the incredible legacy of apartheid. But it's hard to tell somebody to, un to tighten their belts when they see in the shadows of the mountain that life continues pretty much as it has been and is better today. And all that's happened is that people who've lived there historically are joined there by our politicians. But the desperate circumstances of the poorest of the poor communities, who are mainly black, continues without any great interventions. And that's what we must respond to. We must respond to that because if we don't speak as good people, there will be others who want to speak to those ambitions of people. And I'd be outraged if people with 250,000 rand watches on their arms talks about the plight of the poor. The poor is exactly poor because there are others who have been too greedy and have been too extravagant and their excessive opulence is often floated in the face of poor people. And so those demagogues who will rise up and profess to speak for the poor will do it for their own ambitions, not for the ambitions of the country. But that places a greater responsibility and those who really care about where it is that we want to go.